This week on the show, we have Dr. Jim Stupani, who over the last 25 years has helped millions of people change their lives through science-based training, nutrition, and supplementation. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for watching. This show is all about giving you insights and showcasing brands that help you to live your best life and give you confidence. As always, I want to kickstart your morning with some motivational advice to help you to feel inspired and energized to start your day. Today, I want to talk about the importance of understanding the polarity of life. We see this best in nature with plants. Plants need both the sunshine and the rain to grow and flourish. Similarly, the highs and the temporary lows in life are equally important as there are lessons to be learned in both experiences. The reality is it's only when we have obstacles in our lives that we grow, evolve, and push ourselves out of our comfort zone. Motivation rarely happens when life is going perfectly, but when an obstacle forces us to grow and become better. If everything was always sunshine, how would we evolve and learn life's most valuable lessons? When you understand that the polarity of both sunshine and rain are required for growth, we understand the polarity of life and see the value in both the good and the bad. We then can begin to see setbacks as an opportunity for growth and simply happening for our success and expansion. As the saying goes, life is happening for you, not to you. Stay tuned. Coming up after the break. Mm -hmm. And prior to creating JYM Supplement Science, I know that you were a health consultant for people like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, and LL Cool J. Uh, how are you helping them achieve their fitness and health goals? Yeah, so I've I've been very fortunate to work uh, with a lot of top level uh, musicians, actors, and, and, and athletes, which I really enjoy. I've been training people since I was. 18, 18 years old. And you know, you, the normal person that you get often needs a lot of prodding, hand holding, uh, and, and a lot of emotional support. Yet when you're working with these top level athletes, um, you know, I've worked with Mario Lopez, uh, Chris Pine, getting him ready uh, for his roles, LL Cool J, uh, Dr. Dre, um, The Rock, you know, these are people who don't need that hand hold. Mm -hmm. they're ready to go and so the results that they achieve are far quicker um and and, and far more impressive than what you normally see because of the mentality that they have they're already you know they're already set up for success so when you ask them to do something they do it next up on the show we have dr jim stupani who over the last 25 years has helped millions of people change their lives through science-based training nutrition and supplementation he is also the founder of jym supplement science and jimstupani.com which are groundbreaking sports nutrition and online fitness companies dr stupani thank you so much for being on the show today how are you doing wonderful thank you for the invitation well, thank you for being here. And Dr. Stupani, I want to talk a little bit about you before your creation of JYM Supplement Sciences. You have a very impressive background. I know that you have a PhD in exercise physiology and been helping people change their lives through supplement sciences. How are you able to align your passion and your career together? Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I do not go a day without being very grateful that I'm allowed to, uh, like you said, literally my passion is my career. So, you know, there's not a day that I actually work, uh, yet I work very hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I was lucky enough to have a dad who um, really promoted fitness lifestyle at a young age for me. Mm -hmm. It sort of runs in my family. His father was a professional boxer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that physical culture uh, runs deep through my family. So my father always worked out. And uh, he built, you know, a gym in the basement. And it wasn't just, you know, like a bench with some barbells and dumbbells. He, and, you know, this is going back into the 70s. He built, you know, like cable systems with pulleys and whatnot. So we had like pull down stations and whatnot in the basement. And so to spend time with my dad, you know, I wanted to hang out and he taught me how to work out. And well, I really gravitated towards it, loved it, and then took it off on my own. And then, you know, when I was graduating high school, and this is going back to 1986 is when I graduated high school. 
the the word exercise science, you know, that's really my my main area of research. Even though I do, you know, physiology and biochemistry, it's really focused around exercise and in nutrition. And Dr. Stupani, following your education, you served as a postdoctoral research fellow at Yale. So tell us about that experience as well. But when I was graduating high school and looking for colleges and and what I really wanted to study, there really wasn't a guidance counselor who can say, oh, you know, you have this interest in exercise and whatnot. You know, go into exercise science or exercise physiology. So, what I thought uh, would be like sports medicine. So I thought being like an orthopedist. So, I actually entered the University of Connecticut as an undergrad, studying what was called sports medicine. But it's that's really athletic training. So, the you know the people you see when you're watching a football game and an athlete gets hurt, the people that run onto the field, those are your athletic trainers. So I started. You know, uh, learning athletic training and sports medicine and injury and injury uh, preventions. But when I was an undergrad, I had a course called exercise physiology, which opened my world to the fact that people were actually studying how exercise,、uh, you know, things like weightlifting were affecting metabolism and, and hormone production. And I was completely hooked. This was this is literally what I wanted to study. I grew up. Weightlifting and reading the fitness magazines. So,、um, you know, Muscle and Fitness magazine. Most people don't even know what that is nowadays. <laughs> magazines, let alone <laughs> fitness、yeah. magazine. But if we, you know, if we rewind to, you know, like say the '90s, that's how people were getting their information. You know,、um, those fitness magazines is where I learned things like muscle type. Um, and you know, fat metabolism versus carbohydrate metabolism, protein intake, and so that's what I really wanted to study. And so, you know, when I walked into exercise physiology, like I said, that really turned my world around.、Uh, and and you know, I was lucky enough to be able to study at places like University of Connecticut, Auburn. Uh, university back in the '90s, which was a big、uh, strength training、uh, lab. I then、uh, went to Georgia Southern, and then went back to University of Connecticut to get my、uh, my my PhD、mm-hmm. in exercise science. And then I went on to Yale you know, Yale School of Medicine,、uh, where I did my postdoc, mainly on、uh, on the way that exercise and nutrition affect your genes. And you know, I was really set up to take on a life of academia and research. That's really what I thought I was going to do. But those muscle magazines that that I pointed to, that I was reading, you know, I always thought the muscle and fitness and whatnot. I thought, you know, I could take my research, which you know, when you do research in the lab and you publish it in, say, American Journal of Physiology, there's only a small handful of people that will actually read. That science, and so I didn't really see how the science was helping many people、uh, better their lives, and so I started taking some of the research I was doing and turning it into more like lay person terminology, and I and I just you know basically cold called Muscle and Fitness magazine, sent them my articles、um, on how this research could apply in the gym, in the kitchen, and whatnot, and they loved. You know, they loved what I was sending them, and so I started writing for the magazines. And then later on, they offered me a position as as the science editor for the magazines, which I I took. And what's interesting is I I was at Yale School of Medicine when I told everyone that I was leaving Yale School of Medicine as this award winning scientist who had、yeah. this you know career. <laughs> go, going that I was leaving to go work for these muscle magazines. They were very, very confused、uh, on why I would make this decision, this horrific decision, which would destroy my, you know, my science、uh, career. And I'm like, you know, no, this is really, this is what my passion is. This is the reason I am, I am a scientist is is because of weightlifting and because of, of of exercise. So, you know, this is a perfect fit for me to go on and be able to take what's happening in the lab. You know what my colleagues are doing, and teaching people how do how do you apply this in the real world? How do you how do you work out differently? How do you eat differently to make you know make a positive change? And so, I left Yale, went on to be the sci the science editor for these magazines, and there you know I was writing articles on working out and you know and nutrition and supplementation. And you know, like I said, back in the '90s, this is how people got their information. You know, a lot of people、mm-hmm. forget there was no, 
you know, nobody was going to the internet to get information. There weren't, there wasn't social media. Um, and so, uh, you know, millions of people who were interested in fitness, this is their main way of getting information. And so it built up a massive audience uh, for me. And then I later did uh, the book Encyclopedia of Muscle and Strength. And then around 2000, uh, 2003 or four, you know, the internet started picking up and I, you know, I saw that as a great way to teach people because with print, it's very difficult to teach somebody how to perform an exercise, right? Mm -hmm. How to, you know, do a bench press. I, 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 I compare it to like teaching somebody how to tie their shoe. Mm -hmm. Would you rather read an article on how to tie your shoe? Right. Mm -hmm. Think about all the nuances that go into the lacing. How do you explain that with just words and just still photos? In a video, it's much easier to teach. And so yeah. I saw that as a great teaching tool. And so I started doing video series on, on muscle and fitness. They had a the muscle and fitness website in addition to the magazines. And that sort of catapulted into, you know, another massive following. And then Facebook and YouTube came out. Um, and, you know, with the social media, and I took the, that. I took the Twitter, answering people's questions, and then that built up this 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 massive uh, audience, um, <clears throat> and then sort of the rest. The rest is history. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot of accolades that you just mentioned. <laughs> and you you did mention Yale. I know that you also won the 2002 Gatorade Beginning Investigator in Exercise Science. So tell us about that accolade as well. Yeah, so I won that through the American uh, Physiological uh, Society, which is a, you know, a big award. That's why, like I said, after winning that award and then sort of it was right around the time, a little after that, a few months later, I left uh, Yale uh, to pursue this science editor position at these muscle magazines. So everybody at, at Yale was dumbfounded um, that I was leaving to go to pursue this. But, um, but yeah, so the research that I was doing um, was on, you know, metabolism and, and, uh, things like fasting, you know, so, you know, intermittent fasting, what we know now back in 2000, we were studying that in the lab and how that affects certain genes. So what we were looking at is how exercise and diet affect genes in, in, in muscle tissue. And so I was doing this research. A lot of it was mainly on, on rats. We we're doing these muscle biopsies so that we can actually look at the metabolism that's going on when they ran, when they fasted, when they were fed uh, and whatnot. And, you know, this what's interesting about the research in, in genes is that a lot of people in, in the exercise community, in the fitness community, really don't understand that everything you do, you know, when you exercise, everything you eat, turns on or turns off genes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really the magic of what happens uh, in the body down at the cellular level. It starts with turning on, activating, or deactivating these genes, um, which produce certain proteins, which, which then, you know, help you increase your endurance or your muscle size, uh, you know, or your fat loss. So, um, so that research award was for, you know, this groundbreaking research that we were doing in the lab on gene regulation and how exercise and diet actually affect your genes. Mm -hmm. And prior to creating JYM Supplement Science, I know that you were a health consultant for people like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock and LL Cool J. Uh, how are you helping them achieve their fitness and health goals? Yeah, so I've, I've been very fortunate to work uh, with a lot of top level uh, musicians, actors and, and, and athletes, which I really enjoy, you know, I really enjoy working with with those types of people, not because they're well known or famous, but they have a different drive. You know, these people are, that are successful, uh, they have a different mentality. And so I always enjoy working with somebody who really, you know, wants to push it. You know, I, I've been training people since I was 18, 18 years old. And, you know, you, the normal person that you get often needs a lot of prodding, hand holding, uh, and, and a lot of emotional support. Yet when you're working with these top level athletes, um, you know, I've worked with Mario Lopez, uh, Chris Pine, getting him ready uh, for his roles, LL Cool J, uh, Dr. Dre, um, 
The Rock. You know, these are people who don't need that handhold. Hold mm-hmm. They're ready to go, and so the results that they achieve are far quicker um, and, and and far more impressive than what you normally see because of the mentality that they have. They're already, you know, they're already set up for success. So when you ask them to do something, they do it. They do it 100%. So I really, really enjoy working with those top level uh, athletes and in, 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 in celebrities. Mm-hmm. I can imagine they have razor sharp focus. So they're already disciplined. So exactly. it must be, yeah, yeah. Yes. exactly. Yeah, yeah. In fact, when I met Dr. Dre, He, and we worked on his nutrition. He's like, you know, I could eat chicken and broccoli every day if you want me to. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, we, we don't need to do that sort of old school bodybuilding diet. You can have far more different food choices just as long as you make the, the, the right choices. But, you know, like I said, that's one example of a person who's willing to do literally anything to uh, reach that goal. Mm -hmm. And I want to fast forward to JYM Supplement Science. Let's talk about your products and how they help people achieve their fitness goals, lose fat, and their overall health and wellness. Yeah, you know, what's interesting about uh, JYM or or Gym Supplement Science is that when I got, you know, when I got into this, obviously, like I said, I was primed to be in academia and research. And then I left that to, you know, be this, I guess, you know, science journalist, if you will, right? or science, you know, exercise uh, expert. I really never intended, even though I was known as a supplement expert um, through Twitter and whether, you know, I use Twitter to answer people's questions like, how do you take creatine, you know, branch chain amino acids, do you need protein uh, powders and whatnot? Despite that I had this expertise, I really never intended to start a supplement company because I'm not a businessman. I'm a scientist and to have a successful company, there's, you know, obviously the products need to be effective, uh, and work, but you know, there's a business sense that, you know, I didn't study business. So I never really intended to start my own supplement line until, until the industry, really the supplement industry started tanking, in my opinion, uh, on the products that they were offering and that was proprietary blend so when you pick up a product like this is my my pre-workout going back to the early 2000s 2005 2006 what a lot of companies were doing if you turn my product around you have something that's called the supple effects panel on the back and on my products i list every ingredient in there and how much is in there but back in 2005 and six and seven They weren't doing that. They weren't telling you how much caffeine is in a product or how much creatine. And you need certain amounts of things like creatine for it to be effective. So if they're not telling you what's in there, um, it's a problem for a number of reasons. So like, let's take caffeine, okay? So let's say you have coffee in the morning, right? Maybe an energy drink. And then you're taking a supplement that has caffeine, but you don't know how much is in there. That could be a problem for a lot of people, right? Getting too much caffeine. And so I saw that as a very dangerous problem in the supplement industry. And then the other thing they were doing is, like I said, they weren't telling you about active ingredients like creatine. And as I said, you need a certain amount of creatine, about four to five grams, uh, maybe a little less depending on, on the type of creatine, but you need a certain amount of these ingredients. Well, I had it when I was working at the magazines, I had to review a lot of these products mm-hmm. and I would contact the companies and ask them, you know, you didn't list the creatine. Can you tell me how much is in there? And a lot of times they would provide me that information, which I was shocked because I would find that they were only putting in like 500 milligrams of creatine, which is half of a gram. And like I said, you need four to five grams of creatine to be effective. And so essentially what they were doing was putting these ingredients like creatine on the label, but not enough for it to be effective. And so what was happening was people were losing um, their trust in supplements because they were getting supplements that didn't have enough creatine or branch chain amino acids, and they weren't seeing the results that you would expect from those supplements. Well, it's not that the that supplements are bad, it's that these companies were making bad products. And so I got fed up because I couldn't even find products that I would take. And so that's when I, when I launched the gym supplement science line, this is in 2013. Like I said, 
I, I'm not a businessman. I never intended to go into the business of supplements, but I was fed up with where the industry was going because it it was turning people away from supplements. And there are many, many good supplements, like I said, as long as you're getting enough. So I started the gym supplement science line as a literally as an educational, I'm an educator. So this was my way of showing them, look, this is what, you know, when you go to the gym, you want to take a pre-workout. This is what a pre-workout should look like this is what it should contain and and this is what it should list on the label everything uh that's in there so i launched that in 2013 and because i had such a big following and these formulas that you see here in this like pre-workout i was teaching people online how to put all these ingredients together they would go buy the creatine they would buy the branch chain amino acids the other amino and, and mix it together now, the problem was it wasn't flavored, so it didn't taste well. So people literally were starting to ask me as well, can you start your own supplement line? If you, you know, if you just made your own line, then I would know what to buy. And so, like I said, I launched that in 2013. And because I had that following and the trust of those those uh, those people, it, it took off over and was an overnight success. Mm -hmm. I agree. When you look at the back of any uh, supplements or even a multivitamin, the ingredients are kind of scary. <laughs> Half of them you don't even know. Um, let's yes. talk about what are some ingredients that we should avoid in supplements, any sort of supplement. And let's talk about the ingredients in your supplements and how they're clean. So, yeah, so it's it's, you know, when we're talking about ingredients, it's really not about more so what to avoid than what to look for. Mm -hmm. Um you know, there, there are few bad supplements. Um, you know, I can't really think of any supplements that are particularly problem. I mean, there, you know, there's some that we've determined, like, a, remember ephedra? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody remembers ephedra, but ephedra was a popular fat burner. Um, and uh, the problem is that people with heart conditions um, are very sensitive and it can affect, can affect the heart. So that eventually was banned um and but again you know if you use the fedra properly in a in a normal person who doesn't have any history of heart issues it, it's completely safe in the wrong hands it could be you know not not safe but instead of really focusing on what ingredients to to avoid you know it's more focusing on the ingredients that you want and like i said the proper amounts that's why it's important to make sure that whatever it is, if it's a pre-workout, if it's a, a green supplement, even, you know, greens, I launched the Jim Green supplement line because if you look at most green supplements, it's the same thing as I was saying. They're, they list the ingredients, but not the amounts, okay? Yeah. So you don't know if you're getting an effective, uh, you know, amount of spirulina, for, mm -hmm. for example, right? Um, and, and so what the Jim Supplement Science line is designed to do is to teach people what each one of these products should look like, whether it's a greens product, whether it's a pre-workout product, whether it's a, uh, a protein powder. And so, you know, it's really about the transparency so that that consumer um, can make the best decision on which product they want to use. Mm -hmm. Walk us through the products in your the JYM Stop of In Sciences because I know it's not just for bodybuilders; it's for everybody. Uh, whether you want to lose weight, um, you know, gain muscle, have more protein in your diet. So walk us through the different products you guys have. Yeah, and in, in, in just general general health. Yeah. Uh, you know, and and that's the you know the real key difference in gym supplement science is that even though a lot of hardcore bodybuilders are using the products like the pre workout. Mm -hmm. You know, we also have a greens product. We have a probiotic uh, product. And so what really started, you know, as I said, when I launched this, it was mainly bodybuilders who were really following me. So mm -hmm. what I started was a what you take before you work out and what you take after for recovery. And, and you know, really, this is all that I was focusing on at the time. But then as I, you know, other issues came up with protein powder. So I then launched a protein powder. And the reason here is that a lot of protein powders, it's not going on now because we've corrected this problem. They were what 
was called, have you ever heard of protein spiking? No, I haven't. So protein spiking is when you basically alter the protein content of your protein powder mm -hmm. with amino acids. And so instead of a complete protein, you know, a pro when you make, when you take protein, let's say it's whey protein, which mm -hmm. most people know, it's a string of amino acids strung together that are then broken down. And so there's all different amino acids in there. There's essential amino acids, there's non-essential amino acids. But when you measure protein in a powder, you measure it through nitrogen. That's what they measure. They measure the nitrogen content. And it's easy to alter nitrogen content by adding certain amino acids, just the amino acids, but it's not a complete protein. And there's other ways uh, as well, even more dangerous ways to spike it. And so with the spiking, this is going back to, you know, 2012, 2013, protein spiking was a big problem because they were literally lying on their labels about how much protein was in there. So then I launched a protein powder and, and, and then we continued with, you know, a, a testosterone product for men, you know, a vitamin D product. And so what really started as a line for really bodybuilders and those fitness enthusiasts who work out now is a, you know, evolved into products for every lifestyle for people who just want quality products that work, that tell you exactly how much is in there mm -hmm. and enhance your health, not put your health at risk. Mm -hmm. Speaking of protein, every dietitian tells us we need more protein in our diets. So how much protein is actually needed in our diets and how do your supplements uh, give you enough of that? So yeah, so protein, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's interesting, uh, you know, because the protein issue has been something that's very confusing for yeah. a lot of people. And, you know, that's the other thing that I use my platform for my social media is to clear up those confusions um, with the real, you know, with the real research and what we really know um, in the real world and protein intake. Yes, depending on your goal. OK, so the normal recommendation uh, for protein is less than half of a gram per pound of body weight. But what the research has shown is that people who exercise, particularly athletes mm -hmm. who train intensely, they need closer to about a gram per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you need to get in about 200 grams uh, of protein mm -hmm. for recovery, for gaining strength, for, for, for gaining uh, muscle. Now, there's a lot of confusion about the kidneys. So, you know, getting too much protein stresses the kidneys. Sure, there is research on protein in, in kidney issues, but these are in, in, in people who have kidney issues. These are people who can't, you know, properly use the kidneys to filter that protein. So there's no research in healthy adults that shows that a higher protein intake is going to damage the kidneys in any way that, you know, that's what the kidneys do. They, they, you know, they filter those, uh, they filter everything that you eat, particularly when you eat protein. And so one of the problems with protein is it leaves ammonia. That's the nitrogen that I was talking about when they were measuring uh, protein powder. And so when you break down protein, you're left with ammonia that has to then be filtered and excreted uh, from the body. And so, some people think, a lot of dietitians think that if you eat too much protein, it's going to put the kidneys under too much stress, but it, it's just not true. That's what the kidneys do. That's what their main function. Unless you're someone who has a compromised uh, kidney function, there's no issues with eating a higher protein diet. And so what we now know about protein, and you know, like I said, it's really interesting because when I started recommending eating a gram of protein, a lot of people were fighting me saying, oh, that's dangerous, that's not practical, that's not helpful. But now that we look at the research, we know that having a higher protein diet is not only more effective for building muscle, but it can also help with weight loss uh, and, and, and fat loss. And there's a number of reasons. And one is the thermic effect of food, meaning that anytime you eat something, your body has to work to digest it and yeah. utilize it, okay? So when we eat fat, right? Let's say you're eating pure fat, like it's a tablespoon of olive oil, let's mm -hmm. say, right? That you would do that. 
the thermic effect of that food, it raises your metabolism by less than 5% fat, okay? Mm -hmm. If you ate carbs, let's say you ate a pure rice cracker, carbohydrates will raise your met metabolic rate by about 5 to 10%. When you eat protein, do you know what the thermic effect is? It's 20 to 30%. It raises your metabolic rate by 20 to 30 wow. percent when you're eating a high protein meal versus a high carbohydrate, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ways that protein helps with weight loss or fat loss is that thermic effect. Your body is burning calories as you're digesting and utilizing uh, that protein. So yes, yeah, so protein is very important. And what's really nice is that if you look back 20, even 10 years ago, Trying to find high protein foods when you're out on the go was very, very difficult. You know, it's easy to find a bagel, a bag of chips, right? Other snacks like peanuts and whatnot. But to mm -hmm. find something like, you know, beef jerky or uh, a, a protein bar was not very easy. Yeah. Now you walk into any 7 Eleven mm -hmm. and there's an, a literally aisle of of yeah, protein yeah. bars and protein yeah. drinks and, and other snacks that are fortified. Uh, with protein because the science is telling us something. And like you said, you do need more protein. And even if you're not a bodybuilder, mm -hmm. it's not a bad idea to increase your protein intake for, like I said, to stay leaner, to have more um, muscle, which is critical as we're, as we, we're getting older, right? We don't want to lose that muscle. That's why, you know, as we get older, our quality of life starts to decline because we start losing muscle. If you're eating enough and a higher protein, it's helping you to maintain muscle and helping you maintain a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. Speaking about achieving your fitness goals, let's talk about your New Year's fitness challenge. Uh, tell us about it. Yeah. So, you know, every year I have three main challenges and one of the biggest ones is what we call our New Year's challenge, which starts in January. Right. So, you know, most people go through the holidays. They sort of lose track of their new, you know, yeah. they're, they're, they let the diet go. Right. They tend to not work out as much because yeah. they promise themselves that in the new year, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start start new and I'm going to start working out and I'm going to, you know, start eating better. And so I started this New Year's challenge to sort of dangle a carrot in 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 front of the people that really need, you know, that that push, that impetus to get this done. And so every year now we do the New Year's challenge where it's one of my workouts we take and we we look at the results they do their before photo and their uh, after photo and then you know we pick a number of winners and so each year we give away about twenty five thousand uh dollars in cash and in, in prizes to various winners and you know the nice thing is is with the with that new year's challenge you're getting everything you need you know there's no guesswork you're getting the workout to follow you're getting the the, the diet to follow and then we also have a nice community particularly on facebook we have a facebook group called the gym army where it is the you know my followers who are there to help those people to encourage them to answer their questions you know um al although i'm doing that on social media as well so you can get you know, you can get input from me directly when you ask a question on social media while you're going through the program, or you can get it from from your peers and the encouragement. And then you have that carrot dangling in front of you, like you're going to win a piece of the twenty five thousand dollars, which, you know, research has shown when you give somebody uh, that, you know, you dangle that carrot in front of them, it helps them to stay motivated and to stay on track with their workouts uh, and their nutrition plan. Hmm. I love that, that they get to lose weight, become healthy, and they have the chance yeah, to also win right. money, right? So that's exactly. definitely motivating. But for, for anyone watching that maybe is not motivated or is, you know, lacking motivation, what would you say to inspire and uplift them? You know, that's the real key. It's, you know, I could give you all the tools. I could give you all the information on what you need to do, how to do it. But if you don't have that inner drive, um, it's very difficult. And so, you know, the thing that I remind people with fitness is 
it's not about, you know, there's one best way to work out. It's really finding what you're going to stick with, right? Yeah. What what are you going to keep coming back to because the the biggest the the biggest thing I in 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 fitness in in hitting your goals and making a change is consistency, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's not so much, you know, am I lifting, you know, enough weight? Am I doing enough cardio. It's really finding those things um, that are going to keep you active. And the other thing is, is, you know, a workout is a workout, but what you really want to look at is your daily activity. Okay. This is, it, it, this is kind of confusing to people because they think, well, I went to the gym and I worked out for an hour, so I'm good on my activity. But if you're sitting at home, at night watching television and you're sitting at a desk all day and you're riding the train to work or your car to commute and you take the elevator or escalator up to your 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 floor you know you're not being active and the easiest way to increase your health to lose weight to look better and feel better is to simply increase your daily activity so you know i i recommend things like parking far you know you go to the grocery store mm -hmm. don't look for the closest parking spot look for the furthest one mm -hmm. it, you know if you can take the stairs whenever versus versus the elevator and increasing that daily activity throughout the day just little bursts of activity throughout the day is going to make a far bigger difference than what calories that you're burning mm -hmm. in your your workout so you know i know you asked really about motivation but it's you know like I said, the motivation to work out is one thing, but it's far easier to simply increase your activity throughout throughout your day. And one of the things I have is called my 30-60 rule. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is every 30 minutes that you're sitting mm -hmm. consecutively at your desk or on the couch, wherever, right? you want to do at least a minute of activity. So okay. every 30 minutes that goes by and you're just sitting at your desk, 30 minutes goes by, get up, do some jumping jacks, do some stretching, walk to the, you know, water fountain, you know, walk up and down the stairs. All it takes is 60 seconds because getting back to the research that I did at Yale School of Medicine in genes, what we know is that when we sit for longer than 30 minutes, we turn off genes that control metabolism, things like carbohydrate and fat metabolism. And then we turn on genes that enhance fat storage mm -hmm. because the body thinks we're basically asleep. The human body really wasn't designed to yeah. sit throughout the day. Mm -hmm. we're, we're designed to be active. And so the 30-60 rule helps to keep your genes activated throughout the day. And like I said, all you have to do every 30 minutes or so that you're sitting consecutively is get up and do a minute of activity. And it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be anything like lifting weights or, or running. It could simply be walking to the water cooler, stretching, doing some jumping jacks, doing a few push-ups. Um, but it helps to keep those genes activated throughout the day so that you are maintaining your best health and you're not gaining excessive body fat. Mm -hmm. I think that's great practical advice because we live in this culture where people are always sitting, sitting at their desk, watching TV, not being we're active. Right now. <laughs> yeah, we're sitting right now. Exactly. We live, we live in this culture where people are not as active as they should be. So I think those are very practical steps that people can take to be more active. And Jim, for all of our viewers that want to buy your supplements and also join your challenge, uh, where can they do so? And even learn more about your story. Sure. So the the challenge is at my fitness website. It's jimstepani.com. So just my name, uh, dot com. Um, that's where you can sign up for the challenge. And then on the supplement line, the gym supplement line, if you want to look at it in person and walk right in, you can go to a GNC. You can go to a vitamin shop. Um, or if you want to order online, you can go to jimsups.com, J-Y-M-S-U-P-P-S.com, or uh, Amazon uh, or iHerb.com. Very nice. We're going to link that information below. Dr. Stupani, thank you so much for being on the show today. Congratulations on all your success. And I love that you're doing something that you're passionate about. This is a passion project for you. It's You didn't just create that supplement line because you wanted to. You did it because it was needed. So I love that. So keep up the amazing work and keep inspiring. Thank you so much, Darielle. And the same uh, for you. Great work. Keep it up.
TAC TV is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple and Android TVs, as well as on Apple and Android phones. Watch us live through YouTube and Facebook.